What are you doing? About 113 watts, that is. <laughs> what? So we're flashing the BIOS. This is really weird. So this is the Tomahawk, but we're going to run the 3900X in the Tomahawk. And there's a little bit of fan noise because the fans are cranked because that's just, it's a test bench. It's an open air test bench. But can the B450 Tomahawk, which I've seen for like 50 bucks on Amazon, go 12 cores AM4? The answer is yes, it actually it can. But we're updating the system so you can see. So the B450, it's still, I mean, it's an inexpensive motherboard, but we're going to run a 960 Pro NVMe Samsung directly into the CPU, no bottleneck, and I've got 64 gigabytes of G-Skill Trident Z memory. 64 gigabytes that we're going to run on a $50 motherboard. Well, it's about 50, 65, something like that. It's a B450 motherboard from middle gen. Now, I mean, you could do this on a B350 motherboard or an X370, but B450. This is a, this is a, you don't need PCI Express 4, you've just got a graphics card, and you're happy with a single NVMe and 64 gigabytes of memory. I mean, that board is maxed out. If you're happy with that, this works. 12 cores. This video is brought to you by Nerd or Die and their new Glitch 2 streaming asset package. I've talked about Nerd or Die quite a bit in the past and I've even used some of their elements even in this AMD coverage series and their new Glitch 2 pack is a revamp of the entire Glitch package with everything they've learned since they've made it including some really awesome assets, some backgrounds, some webcam frames, some just chatting overlays and the alerts even interact with and pop out directly of your webcam frame which is fairly unique and pretty freaking awesome and they're all set up to be customized by code to change the color if desired or directly with the source file so that, that they can all be customized without any quality loss. Head to the link on your screen or in the description below to sign up, give a small kickback to my channel and let them know I sent you. Get this for yourself, enhance your live stream and onward to the video. So what evil have we done here? <laughs> it's a lot of evil. So I wasn't just satisfied with my testing for using the Ryzen 3700X and the new Radeon uh, Navi 5700 graphics card for rendering and DaVinci Resolve or live streaming or any sort of content creation. I wanted to see just how budget we could get. Like, really budget. I don't know what this contraption is that we have to build on. That's a Lee and Lee test bench. It's like the old school Lee and Lee test bench. And we've got it hooked up to a B450 motherboard from MSI. Now we are using an NZXT 280 millimeter all-in-one cooler. You don't need that. All of our all of our original testing was done on the stock cooler that came with it, and it did great. Yeah. Kept it totally cool. So this is just because it's part of the rig here. We added 64 gigs of 2933. Yeah. 64 gigs. 2933. So I've been. <laughs> Why? Yeah. <laughs> this is the most unbalanced rig ever. This is like dropping a V8 in a go kart. And yet, the go kart is beating. The Ferrari, metaphorically. It's so fast. So, <laughs> it's been requested for me that I do some like recommended parts lists or build ideas for streaming rigs and for like rendering machines or editing PCs. And I'm kind of tackling both because we're still finishing up the data for the streaming benchmarks that I'm doing, but it's all leaning heavily that the Ryzen, th the, 3000, the 3900X and the 3700X can pretty much take anything I'm throwing at it up to medium on some pretty insane settings that literally no one in the world streams at yet. And so between that and the fact that it's beating out my, pretty much everything my i9-7980XE can throw at it, the 2950X Threadripper and the 9900K can do in terms of rendering performance for DaVinci Resolve and Premiere for like a $500 budget at most and we're throwing in some overkill parts for some of this you can get the most budget like overkill render server and streaming rig with just this right here. Well, most of the cost in this particular setup is the graphics cards, the Radeon 5700. Yep. new. not the XT, not even the XT. And the 3700X, which is about 329 US. Those are the most expensive parts. Now we've also got 64 gigs of memory in here. You'd right. be perfectly happy with 16. All of my normal benchmarks were done with 16. So uh, we ended up, we have 64 in here and that actually went faster than even in the X570 motherboard. So you will obviously, as I mentioned in my render server videos, like you'll benefit from more RAM, but you don't need it. It's now we did enable PBO as well. There is a PBO option in <laughs> <laughs> in the Tomahawk UEFI, and we did see 4.375 on all cores 
mm, I don't want to call it sustained, but fairly consistently. Yep. The VRM is to get, I mean, it's an open air test bench. It's the best case scenario in terms of cooling, but a uh, little Trooper B450, it, it did it. Yeah, it finished it. it I... Can you believe that there's a company that supports, you know, the AM4 platform in such a way that you can actually use these really high-end chips on relatively inexpensive motherboards if all you need is one GPU, one yeah. fast NVMe, and, you know, I mean, the the, the network is, is not a high-end network. The audio is not a high-end audio. The PCB layout is not super high-end, and yet we can still do 2933. We got the one PCI Express by 16 slot, which is fine for our graphics card. Everything's running at PCI Express 3.0, not yeah. 4.0, yeah. just to be clear. And this clears up what I was wor which I, what I was trying to determine with our rendering benchmarks and like what the actual optimization that was benefiting us the most here is, and it looks like it's the cache bump on the 3700X, not even the uh, and not even necessarily the PCIe bandwidth, although that was clearly part of it, but like we're still hitting similar numbers here, so. Nice. Yeah. Good, good job, everyone involved. <laughs> yeah, like this is, I, I, I don't know that I would be publishing these videos had I not run these tests as many times as I have on these different configurations because they sound that unbelievable. But at this point, I... <laughs> extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. There it sits, it's a B450. <laughs> I don't know what else to say other than loop back to the Tom's Hardware <laughs> article of do you want to spend your life not having this in it? <laughs> Just buy it. When you first saw Halo, were you blinded by its majesty? Blinded? Paralyzed? Dumbstruck? No. And so in terms of a, like a dedicated streaming or render rig, uh, for a render rig you could throw in a 10 gigabit NIC, assuming you can orient your PCIe lane spacing enough, or alternatively if you don't need 10 gig, which most people aren't using, you can throw in a capture card. Can't do both. Um, but at least not can, with this motherboard. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna have to spend a little bit more on the motherboard. But this to motherboard, do that. 50 bucks? Like, Compared to the bigger X570 boards, which can get up to like a thousand bucks, yeah, this is well, insane. Well, the flagship boards are like seven hundred to a thousand. There are two hundred dollar oh, yeah, X570 yeah, yeah. options, yeah. but it's going to be in that three hundred dollar range. So, yeah. six times more expensive. But you get PCI Express four, and you get you get you get stuff. You spend more, <laughs> get more, but that's pretty. You but get a you, lot. Yeah, if you just need something that just works and goes, like this is bonkers, and <laughs> it is some completely bonkers. Oh, and uh, electrical power usage, oh, yeah. like 250 watts peak. Yeah, we're only powering this with a 550 watt power supply. <laughs> it's it's a cute little Seasonic power supply. It's modular, but I mean, it's uh, like we're not even coming close to 550 watts, even with both the CPU and the GPU pegged. And spoiler alert: in my videos, I'm doing the 12 core, and even with the 12 core, we don't exceed about 350 watts. Worst case scenario, with more peripherals in here and a higher end GPU. Meanwhile, my i9 that is getting beat by this is enough to make my 1500 watt UPS beep at me because it's under too much load when you add in a couple monitors. <laughs> like I am so dumbfounded at this point by all of the results that I've gotten over the past couple sessions of testing this stuff that all I can say is just buy it. <laughs> if this is what you were waiting for, I, I have spent so much time mocking all of the claims of just wait for X, just wait for Y. People have been saying just wait for Navi for like five years. Just wait for Ryzen, just wait for Ryzen 2000, just wait for Zen 2. Waiting for Zen 2 was the right choice. The crazy thing here is that uh, <laughs> this is not, these Navi cards are not meant to be flagship cards. Mm -hmm. The encoder performance is flagship, the gaming performance is not flagship, but it's a good value for the money in my right. opinion. But the encoder performance is kind of bananas. And I mean, if you can get a cheaper 2060, 1660 Ti, like if, it, if this is purely for streaming or rendering where you don't need direct like GPU load, a cheaper 1660 or 1660 Ti will be more budget friendly, but if you if you just want to go all red, especially for something like Resolve, which is in Linux, once Navi support is added to Linux, everything's smoother on AMD graphics for Linux once the support is added. And game at 90 FPS at yeah. 1440p, 5700 XT. Yeah. So I wanted to spend some time in this video talking about my streaming benchmark data. I will have a separate video coming later in the week as I have to space out my uploads after I've uploaded three within 24 hours or I don't get notifications. But essentially I've built my own streaming performance benchmark for processors as I feel like the traditional throw it on slow at 1080p 60 and see how many frames are dropped streaming benchmark is completely wasteful. A, uh, compression and encoding load as you go up in the CPU usage presets is not a linear curve of uh, difficulty to perform. Slow shouldn't be used for real time or live video encoding 
situations in the first place, which is something I established in my X264 quality analysis and slow is not worth it video. And it doesn't really scale, as I mentioned, it's not linear. It doesn't really scale performance in the same way that you think about in terms of difficulty and similarly to like normal game benchmarks. And so I am posing a completely different streaming benchmark methodology, which for all I know, Gamers Nexus or somebody has already come up with for their Zen launch review as well. And it beat me to the punch since this is my later video in the day. But essentially what I start with is streaming at very fast through medium and looking at the total number of frame drops. However, that doesn't tell the full picture. So what I also take into account is your frame times. And in this particular video, I don't have the data for frame times like to show you analytically, but I was taking note of it and taking note when the game either became unplayable or became difficult to play due to spiking frame times or inconsistent frame times, you know, when the stream is affecting your gameplay. And that is very important to me and something that completely gets left by the wayside and something left out of AMD's benchmark as their situation where both systems were under 99% GPU load, the game was actually fairly unplayable for the player in that situation. And that is super important for game streamers and something that I get a lot of comments about where it's like, my stream isn't lagging, but my game is lagging. What do I do? This is kind of trying to work around that. But not only that, I wanted to scale it to actual increase the difficulty in a linear fashion, much like gaming benchmarks. So instead of just doing 1080p 60, I also did 1080p 120 and 1440p 60. Now I realize nobody is really streaming this at this exact moment, although some people are streaming 1440p to YouTube since the bitrate allows for it. And actually Riot Games has done some investing and some looking into getting 120 FPS streaming for League of Legends. This is something that will happen in the future, so having this data now is beneficial, and it just gives you an idea of an actual scalable render load, which slow does not give you. So hopefully this data is interesting for you, and I wanted to start out with, I compared my Intel Core i9-9900K, since that was the topic of discussion and it kind of matches with the 3700X, along with the Ryzen 9 3900X, Ryzen 7 3700X, my full beefy i9-7980XE, the 36-thread monster, and Threadrippers, the only one usable in Windows really, 2950X, so that you could see where things start to go. And I'll hopefully have some graphs. This is very difficult to convey, so I am looking for feedback before I finalize this full methodology. And I'm actually waiting on NVIDIA's new tool, which should help me document frame times a little bit better. Otherwise, I'm going back to Fraps, because Afterburner doesn't seem to actually benchmark this data. It just shows it. So I'll be showing some like crops in of the graph, I guess. On my 9900K, even at 1080p 60, you can see that all the way down to medium, you don't in Overwatch, you don't really drop any frames. It's like 12 total frames. It's 0.1%. It's it's nothing. But once you start getting past fast, like once you fast starts introducing some hitches and some hiccups and it starts to feel a little uncomfortable to play and then medium really ramps that up even if the stream is not showing it. At 1440p 60, this is really bad. At medium, it's completely unplayable, and anything lower than faster, pretty much, it starts to really get gnarly. Even though, again, the stream itself isn't dropping a whole lot, the experience that the viewer and the player gets due to the weird frame jitter is not a very good experience. And then drop it down 120 frames per second, and again, faster is fine, but fast and medium are pretty much unplayable and unwatchable. And this also helps shows my point about this not being linear. You have very fast, faster and fast on a lot of these games that don't show any frame drops until you get to higher resolution or frame rate and then fast on higher resolution and frame rates and then just medium at 60 frames per second just suddenly has all of the dropped frames because the computational requirements and the complexity of the encoding as you go from CPU usage preset to preset to preset is not a linear increase. Uh, that's as much as I'll harp on it. The other game that I got to test here in this situation, I ended up only getting to test three games, and I will need a serious rallying of comments and feedback if you guys actually want me to go in-depth with these kinds of streaming benchmarks, because it took so long. I am, it is 2.30 a.m. the night before the launch is supposed to happen. We're like seven hours out from launch. And I'm still, I'm only just now finishing up the benchmarking just to have these three games documented. And only, and the third game is only documented on two processors. It took so long. I only had such little time with the hardware. It takes so long to document this and it's so much work. And even on our second session, I had my wife helping out doing some of the benchmarking in Overwatch and Guild Wars because 
it takes so much work to get this done. So I'll need some serious rallying both in the comments and just in general so I can try to get AMD to actually send me this hardware so I can do a full series document all this for everything. Because otherwise, by me putting this out there, Gamers Nexus or Hardware Unboxed or someone with a staff and more time is just going to, you know, plow me over with documenting this themselves. So in Guild Wars 2, I tested this because it's very CPU bound. It's an MMO and typically the big world boss events generally run like crap anyway, even if you're not streaming. And I wanted to cover this as well. And again, same thing, 1080p 60, you don't really see any frame drops. 1440p 60, you don't see any until fast and medium, but it really starts to impede gameplay. Like typically you're used to 20 and 30 frames per second frame rates uh, in these big bosses anyway, but this really starts to make the cursor kind of not go where you want it to and things like that. And then 1080p 120, again, it's fine up until fast. Fast, it drops a few frames and then it drops a third of the frames at medium. For a quick comparison, I'm not going to run through all of this, but virtually no frames ever drop on my 7980XE and the game performance is not impeded whatsoever. It was a smooth sailing experience because it has all the threads to handle this, even for Overwatch and Guild Wars, which are both CPU reliant games in terms of your gameplay experience. Flipping over to the Threadripper 2950X, mostly the same experience, but consistently once you get past 1080p60, so 1440p60, 1080p120, medium is just a nightmare and at 1080p 120 for overwatch uh fast is a nightmare and started to really impede per gameplay as well but otherwise other than medium gameplay performance and the actual stream was not super impacted because this thing is just a beast of a thread ripper now the new ryzen chips in comparison you'll see quite a bit of dropped frames primarily on medium again 30 percent to 56% depending on the game and the resolution and the frame rate. But at virtually no point do you notice the gameplay being hindered. My wife didn't report any. I couldn't report any. Every once in a while there'd be a small frame hitch. But compared to my 9900K where there'd just be like constant choppiness and hitching and things like that in these games. The 3700X and the 3900X respectively. And the 3900X barely dropped anything even on medium 3700x struggled quite a bit with medium but otherwise uh, due to the different ccx's or whatever your stream can perform really poorly and your game performance still be fine which was blowing my mind because the whole oh 9900k can't stream it can even on medium at 1080p 60 in some cases but the performance difference on your game versus the stream is fairly significant going even from the 8-core 9900K to the 8-core 3700X and the 3900X just eats it all for breakfast and blows it out the water. Now on the 3700X on CSGO 1080p 120 FPS I started to notice every once in a while a little hitch on fast and then quite a bit on medium but it wasn't quite as bad as Overwatch on the 9900K but even CSGO on the 9900K I was dropping frames but the game still ran fairly smoothly, smoothly. So that was the latest one I had ran on the 9900K and it still ran very well. I was quite impressed. So yeah, I will again, let me know in the comments below if you want to see me actually doing some thorough streaming benchmarks on all the hardware I can get my hands on and if AMD should send me the hardware because this is something that requires a significant co or time investment and potentially cost investment if I can't get the hardware. So I need to know that you guys want this, but I think it's worth it. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. But the <laughs> these processors are beasts for streaming. Definitely. If you're going to be single PC streaming, I'd lean heavily towards the 3900X or wait for the 16 core. But both of them can do it as long as your expectations are, you know, appropriate. It's it's not, it's just completely nuts. We got a full article and videos. You've got a ton more videos. Yep. There's so much more content you can check out if this has piqued your interest. Links in the description. Otherwise, like, comment, subscribe. I, there's so much. We'll I've, see you later. Yeah.